Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. It's T-7 on the first ever trial of a former president and Donald Trump's increasingly frantic and flailing maneuvers to get what he's always been able to wrest from the system, another delay, seem destined to fail. The hard-nosed judge in his case coolly swatted away his immunity argument as untimely, a rationale that leaves him without recourse for appeal just one short week before prospective jurors are set to gather in Manhattan's criminal court. The Florida Supreme Court issued a much-watched abortion decision, both approving of a new restrictive law and greenlighting a permissive voter initiative for the November ballot. It promised to shine a Klieg light on the state through 2024, attract activists and big dollars, and, at least in the opinion of some, put the recently solidly red state back in play for Joe Biden for the presidential election. Immigration is the other issue apart from abortion that seems best to capture the cultural and political fault lines between the parties. This week, Trump, campaigning in Michigan and Wisconsin, denigrated migrants crossing the southern border as animals, and when called out on it, doubled down on the epithet. The White House was quick to condemn Trump's malice. To assess these pitched battles in the courts and on the hustings, we have a terrific roundtable of savvy and sophisticated analysts. And they are. Molly Jong Fast, a special correspondent for Vanity Fair, the host of the podcast Fast Politics, and her first time on Talking Feds. Molly, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Josh Marshall, a journalist, blogger, and the founder of Talking Points Memo. And I have to say this every time because it's true. It's the best blog out there and my go-to. He also hosts the Josh Marshall Podcast. Josh, thanks as always for joining. Thank you. And always a great honor, Senator (laughs) Sheldon Whitehouse. He served as senator from Rhode Island since 2007. In the Senate, he chairs the Budget Committee, serves on Judiciary, Finance, and Environmental and Public Works Committees, and he's been a leader on Supreme Court ethics, to say the least, and climate legislation. He previously was the U.S. Attorney in the District of Rhode Island and AG in Rhode Island. We are so fortunate to have you. Thanks for joining Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Thrilled to be here. All right. Actions on several fronts in the Trump legal wars this week, but the dominant development is that nearly seven years after the beginning of what you might characterize as his long crime scheme as president and candidate, Donald Trump is standing trial for events around the 2016 election. So let's just start there. All kinds of what seemed cataclysmic misdeeds, starting with the excess Hollywood tape, have seemed to have, if anything, a positive political effect on Donald Trump. But we're talking something that is really vivid as a matter of political theater. Trump in the chair, four days a week, glowering, impotent, facing the music as witnesses parade in and tell about his misconduct. So, Does that strike you as the sort of tableau that will, in fact, really harm him politically? I think it starts before he gets into the defendant's chair. It starts as the pressure of what's coming at him increasingly makes him look crazier and crazier and say more despicable things and slowly but steadily drive away potentially middle of the road people who are dissatisfied for various reasons, but can be spooked by him getting too out of hand. I also think that there is no, we have no precedent for a presidential candidate sitting in a courtroom in a criminal case of his own. And like, there's been so many lawyers who've been like, well, it's not a great case. Alvin Bragg, there's no precedent. It's a state crime. Then it's a federal crime. What does that mean? You know, you should say it's election interference and not hush money. 
The idea that hush money to a porn star sounds too good because it doesn't sound serious enough, I think pretty much shows that this is actually more of a political problem. I mean, in any other world, this would be like an absolute career ender. Exactly. And maybe in this world, too. We've talked about it in the abstract, but holy shit, New York versus Donald Trump in the chair as Hope Hicks and other witnesses come forward. Because as you say, Molly, most people have been thinking, oh, this isn't the big one and it's just New York. But I'm not sure they've absorbed the vividness of the sort of theater we are about to see. I would say, look, who better to pay hush money to? (laughs) <laughs> than a porn star. Yeah. Let's at least give Donald Trump credit, right? Look, I think you're basically right. There's always been this long process of normalization with Donald Trump that completely over the top, crazy things constantly happening. And no one can stay in a state of of high agitation permanently. So you kind of, okay, well, I know he's facing, you know, felony indictments in four separate jurisdictions. Okay, got it. Like that's that's our year and he owes half a billion dollars to the state of New York and okay, blah 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 blah. All of these things to me kind of run together in the sense of possible political impact that you're going to spend the year being reminded of this guy's really over the top and there's tons of drama. And what the fuck? What's going on, right? Do we want this again? I think that's one political impact, and of course it should be. I've never bought the idea that this helps him at all. Right. That it's a Br'er Rabbit strategy for him, right? Yeah, that's part of the Trump psych-out thing that has always been part of Trumpism. Oh, you think that hurt me? Oh, it only makes me stronger. (laughs) (laughs) Make my day, right. Yeah, so there's a constant part of his drama that is important not to get pulled into. And to Senator Whitehouse's point, he could end up in prison. That's scary. That's scary for anybody. It's especially scary for someone who has the fear of being dominated at the center of his whole kind of psychological universe. And look, that would be terrifying for anybody to spend time in prison. So I do think that's going to make him just get weirder and weirder. And that when we're talking about Donald Trump getting weirder, we're talking about some some very strange territory. Let's be honest. There's some guardrails around that weirdness that I don't think he's really appreciating. And one is, if he keeps getting weird about Judge Merchant's family, Or if he keeps getting weird about Gene Carroll after several huge financial judgments have not been able to deter him from defaming her, then we're kind of getting into a couple of nights in the cooler category with regards to contempt. And all of that adds a whole new and more immediate risk to him. I want to move to that in a second, just to make a couple legal points. Let me make an observation, which is we've been talking about two things in response to my question. The first is the possibility that he himself, I I use the term, I think, wigging out, trying more and more, but I think he's just up against a brick wall to try to delay things. He's always managed, and this really is, you know, facing the music. That's one. And then separate, how vivid is it for the American people and the political impact? Just quickly in terms of going to the pokey, Merchant is being pretty tough on him, and I think there is a custodial sentence in the works here, but I can't see any judge, Merchant included, putting him in pending appeal. And that means, to me, the doors you know, don't close at the earliest for you know over a year. Nevertheless, it's a terrifying prospect. But let me go back to what you were just raising, because on the one hand, Merchant seems to have pretty firm hold on the reins, but Trump is the ultimate bucking horse. Are we going to be seeing these sensational showdowns and in-court melodrama? Because it's different now. There's a jury seated. And if he says these things, even about Merchan or Bragg or whatever, that could corrupt the jury. And I could really see Merchan saying, all right, if maybe not go to Rikers, but there's a nice holding pen in the back. Why don't you spend your time there and see if that sobers you up some? That would not be uncommon. We've seen that done in courtrooms pretty regularly. 
Well, my question is on that. I mean, because obviously, and I think we've seen too much of many judges just unwilling to treat him as a normal defendant. And I understand the pressure they're under and everything. You know, you see it with the delays and all sorts of stuff. But at some level, I cannot imagine that happening. On the other hand, he's making a mockery of the judge at this point. He's going back to attacking his family. I mean, I had a moment a couple of days ago where I was thinking of, you know, I've seen a lot of mafia trials and the mobsters don't do that. You know, at a certain level, their action, not talk. But it's I just had a moment where I kind of came back to reality and thought, how totally insane is this? This guy is like ranting about the judge's family. And and again, I do think you're going to quickly get to a point where the judge will just become a joke if he does not actually do something that gets Trump's attention. You know, it's funny because yesterday I was on Steph Rule's show and she asked me about how there's this piece in the L.A. Times about how the January 6th committee members are preparing for if Trump gets in power, if he tries to send them to jail. And I thought to myself, holy, can I curse here? Yeah, yeah, no, cursing is good. Holy fuck. Oh, I didn't know you were going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I thought, oh, my God, if this guy wins, we are like having this normal political news cycle. And if this guy wins, he's going to try to throw all his political enemies in jail. Totally. But, Senator, don't people talk about that in the Senate? Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. We're pretty much focused on trying to legislate and trying to make sure we win in November. I think the, those doomsday conversations happen if things look bad before November and if things go bad in November in what will be some very deadly weeks between uh, November and a inauguration of a certifiable person as president of the United States. Certifiable something. Um, Josh, I just want to go back to your point because you're right. Look, Merchant's a pretty smart and tough customer. So when he expanded the gag order, he made a point of not letting Trump get his goat. He put it on broad platform of all the witnesses, not about his daughter uh, specifically. But if Trump really, really wants to go to jail and challenge him, he wants as much room as possible as sort of many different steps. But there's that penultimate step where he has to look at him and say, Mr. Trump, the next time you do this, and then he's got to follow through, and I think he will. But there are less draconian steps like go to the back of the holding cell for the day and start again tomorrow and that kind of thing. Even that in optic terms, I think is a pretty big deal. That's still, you're still under confinement then, aren't you? Fuck yes. You're under, <laughs> you are in the custody of the good, uh, you know, marshals of the, of the people of New York, no doubt about it. I mean, that's the thing. And he's trying to have one other card to play, an interesting, not very well noticed point in his order. He can do one other thing that would hurt Trump a little, not tell him. And this is only done in mob cases. We're not going to tell you the names of the jurors, but his lawyers would still have them. So I think if he continue, if he says, make my day again and again, we're going to have quite the spectacle in court. And remember that as Trump lost his two motions to dismiss, two of his former lawyers also had very bad days with regard to their own disbarment. His lawyers have to be looking at that jury list and saying, if this gets through to Trump, there goes my ticket, perhaps. So the stakes have gone up a lot for Trump lawyers. They've gone up a lot for the lawyers. And also for the lawyers, like I think, you know, Todd Blanche's his lawyer played to his client by talking about DA misconduct and he had nothing. Murchan, you know, really was tough on him. He And he's called him out and Trump out. Even in this immunity motion, he said, not only are you untimely, but I basically think this is just a ploy, a last minute gambit to delay. In other words, Trump and his lawyers both heading into this trial have lost the judge. The judge thinks they're liars. And what is? It, how do you play it then, even if you're trying to be a smart lawyer? I think we'll see them just try to stage spectacles and get his goat. So it's going to be pretty interesting. Let me just say that. 
But doesn't Trump always lose the judge? What a fantastic segue, Molly <laughs> John Fast, because we can go down to the other case this week, the Mar-a-Lago prosecution, and one Judge Eileen Cannon, the judge who Trump seems not to have lost, in fact, who seems to be doing everything to help him. But just to take your point, I do think it's right, and they happen every week now. Royce Lamberth on the D.C. District Court just yesterday in sentencing all these marauders who, who Trump calls heroes and will pardon in the D.C. cases, you have the judges more and more being emboldened to really call out what this is. They're not hesitating now to basically call him a liar and a rogue, but not in Mar-a-Lago. That could be the easiest case in a sense. It's cut and dried. The evidence is overwhelming. But she's really been doing, you know, everything to kind of keep it on pause. So if you followed these last few days, does it look as if Cannon has sort of been chastened and that that case is potentially on track? Or is she never going to let this case go forward before November? I think they're wrestling with each other. The pleadings are only a ripple of what's really going on. There's kind of a tactical chess match happening with her trying to jam the prosecutor into accepting that the Presidential Records Act has a role. And then he fights back and says, no, both of your scenarios are impossible. And then she has to acknowledge that, but she drops in the word pretrial hinting that later on she might come back to it once Jeopardy is attached, and then you can get rid of the case for Trump then. And so now he has a potential you know, motion eliminated to say, it's not decided what's going to happen to trial. She only said pre-trial, I'm filing a motion eliminated to say, Presidential Records Act has nothing to do with this. And the same thing, I need a quick decision, so I've got time to appeal. And then we'll see what he does. And Senator, I've been telling people that was a really notably hard-hitting filing. Do you agree? Uh, somewhat. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I, I thought everything he said was completely fair game. If I was reviewing that pleading from a staff prosecutor, I'd be comfortable going ahead with that. I don't think it breached any boundaries. And in fact, when she pushed back and said, you are demanding that I make a pretrial determination about the jury instructions, and that's not fair and that's not precedented, that is exactly what she was doing. She was demanding that the government make a binding determination pre-trial about jury instructions and in a way that would have been unlawful. So I think she's feeling a little bit caught out and in kind of a Trumpian way, she's accusing the prosecutor of doing exactly what she did. Yeah, I agree. I just mean it, they made a decision. We're not going to take this and, and we're going to push back instead of playing ball. He drew clear, bright lines. No doubt about it. He drew clear, bright lines. This is the time to draw them, they said. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I like to stay in the South as long as we're in crazy, politically overheated and hopelessly conflicted third largest state in the country. Let's take on the developments this week in the Florida Supreme Court involving abortion. So Molly, if I can start with you, the court issued these two different rulings, one of which had the effect of maybe triggering a new restrictive law, one of which had the effect of serving up a whole new and relatively for the South in particular pro-choice law. Can you, I know you've been following it. Can you just kind of sketch out what happened this week? So what happened this week was the Florida Supreme Court had two different rulings. One was an abortion ruling. So Florida has historically been a safe Southern state for abortion. And they've had relatively for the South lax abortion laws. So there had been a 15-week ban. Governor DeSantis, because he thought he was going to be the presidential, the Republican presidential nominee in the dead of night, signed a six-week ban, which hold terribly and is a sea change for the state of Florida. The Supreme Court said it can go into effect. Thus, So that law is now in 30 days going to go into effect, which means and then you had this ballot initiative that's actually a really well done, very clear ballot initiative that's going on the ballot in Florida, but it needs a 60 percent threshold to pass. But there's no reason why it can't. 
Is it clear? I mean, the three dissenters were saying it, it's not clear. So you, you don't buy that? No, it's actually a really clear, really well written. That was Ron DeSantis' line, too. It's not clear. People don't understand. I mean, you'll remember the Florida legislature was able to overturn this bringing back felons voting rights because they I mean, they're very obsessed with giving people democracy, sort of. But <laughs> They had no choice. I mean, they had almost a million signatures. I mean, this is a sea change. So what's going to happen that I think will be very interesting is so in 30 days that goes into effect, you have a six week ban, you have this huge state, and then they go in November and they vote on this. So they will have experienced exactly what they're voting on. And historically, when this happens, it is as we say, a uh, legal term, complete shit show, shit show. For, the, for the party <laughs> that is in power. So will Democrats flip the state? Every political like pundit says, absolutely not, and cracks up. But you're going to see like all the stuff you saw out of Louisiana, doctors afraid to treat women under 12 weeks. You're going to have to go into the parking lot and bleed out. Your fever is going to need to be higher before we can give you in abortion, we can't prove you have sepsis yet right now. I mean, these are the stories, you know, that are really why Roe was defined so broadly in 1973. So I think it's a perfect storm. And everything Ron DeSantis has done in Florida has been in the pursuit of the presidential, the Republican presidential nomination. And the man has really, I think, screwed himself with the inflation and the insurance premiums going way up. And He's really he's done a lot of really dumb stuff while being focused on running for president. Let me move to Josh for this, because I think the conventional wisdom has been that Florida has gone too red to actually be in play. But I listened to your podcast where you, you were opining otherwise. So do you share Molly's view that this is a seismic enough event to actually put into play? What is it? Twenty five, twenty, the, you know, the big Florida prize that really in the last several cycles hasn't been within Democrats' grasp, at least at the presidential level? Yeah, I mean, I don't expect Biden to win Florida. And I buy to a significant extent the conventional wisdom that the state has sort of, just as Georgia has moved in a blue direction, Florida in the opposite direction. But I do think one needs to go back and remember that Trump won Florida by about 1.5 or 1.4% in 2016, and he won it by, I believe, 3.4% in 2020. Those are not big margins at all. Those are very close races. So it's almost in spite of my belief in the conventional wisdom. I don't think you can look at those numbers and say, okay, this is Ohio, or actually it's uh, Iowa, right? A, A state that used to be a swing state and now very red. It's not like that. So I actually think this is a pretty big deal. And there's a lot, you know, Florida is not, it's not Ohio. To the extent it is a red state, it has a kind of a somewhat more libertarian tinge to its Republican Party, even though obviously it has the, you know, DeSantis, don't say gay kind of part to it. Uh, certainly South Florida is a different kind of place. So I, I don't rule it out, but winning is not the only thing. It's the only thing in Florida. But in a presidential contest, you always have maybe a dozen states that are being fought over. They're not the ones that are, it's probably going to come down to. Simply making the Trump campaign have to fight for Florida, which I think they unquestionably will. I think they'll fight, they'll probably win. But if you make Florida a fight, that's dollars that can't go to Georgia and can't go to Pennsylvania and so forth. And we don't know if it's going to end up that way, but at least for the moment, Biden has a pretty big cash advantage. And you have other factors playing in here with what's happening at the RNC. You know, we really don't know about that. I mean, we, we it's pretty clear that a lot of money for the RNC is going to go to paying for Trump's legal expenses and the sort of de facto hush money for his co-conspirators, whose lawyer expenses are all also getting picked up. But as much as we live in an era where political parties aren't as big as they used to be, The National Party committees are pretty important in national mobilization efforts. They sustain state parties and stuff. So 
there's, in my mind, a big question about what is the RNC essentially becoming a Trump slush fund? How does that play into the dynamics of the rest of the election? So I think it's a pretty big deal. And I don't think we can rule out Florida being in play. The one thing I will point out is that not only is 60 higher than 50, but it has been very hard for, I mean, we treat it rightly as a given that all of these initiatives, all of these amendments win, right? That's why Republicans fight so hard not to allow them to get on the ballot because they they breeze past 50. But I believe that Kansas was 59%. Ohio was 57%. It's tough to get to 60. I do think there's reasons about the sort of the dynamics of Florida that may be, but it's tough. It's really tough to get to 60. Senator, I want to broaden Molly's point about everything we're going to see on the ground in Florida, but because that, those are all very hard hitting points about reproductive rights and justice. But you recently gave a speech about abortion as more broadly also an issue of economic justice, in which case it you know plays into even broader election themes between Biden and Trump. Could I just ask you to elaborate and tell us how that dovetails with what perhaps is going on in Florida? You know, there's often a fair amount of blowback when these really radical and extreme laws are put into effect. Companies have trouble recruiting women to come and work for them there. Companies want to be on record objecting to it. Companies don't want to have trade shows or sports events there. And so there could be a pretty significant economic blowback. And it's happening also in the context of Florida having a really epic home insurance meltdown which is costing regular Floridians many thousands of dollars extra than just a year or two ago, and that's not getting any better. So the economic upset in Florida could be really considerable by November, particularly if a hurricane has dropped in and blown out the state-backed property insurer. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a really, really angry electorate And the Republicans, you know, they've held most of the offices, so it's hard for them to try to dodge the blame when an electorate is that angry, both about abortion and about economic effects and about feeling isolated from the national economy and about their home insurance collapsing. Is the reason that the insurance so bad in Florida because the Republicans allowed a monopoly? It's fundamentally because the Republicans won't address climate change and pretend that it's not happening. And so hurricane sea level rise, all of that, they've been extremely slow to react. And it gives, I think, a very strong case for putting responsibility on the Republican Party for the insurance meltdown there because they own their relationship with the fossil fuel industry. And frankly, they don't they don't drill much, and they don't pump much in Florida. So it's all about political money. And an angry electorate is even angrier about people doing stuff that hurt them for out-of-state political money. Just to close out about where things are going, and, and Molly, you had a very, you tweeted in Fastian fashion, if Republicans were smart, they would at least pretend they weren't coming for birth control pills, IVF, the morning after pill, IUDs, but they can't even pretend. So it's weird. It's the sort of dog that caught the car phenomenon because there are certain states that, among other things, are, are, you know, wanting to implement life begins at conception bans. They did it in Alabama. Right. Do you see the crusade here in the wake of Dobbs actually going full on toward methods of birth control? So what I think the problem is, yes, for sure, I think they're coming after the birth control pill. But what I think the problem is, is they painted themselves into a corner with evangelicals. And so evangelicals are not satisfied. They want embryonic personhood. And I think embryonic personhood means no birth control pill, no IUDs, no morning after pill. Once an embryo is a person, that, you know, which is fucking ridiculous, but that sets you down a road that is a logistical, just from purely logistical standpoint, not from a political standpoint, logistically a nightmare. And I think they have a real problem because evangelicals 
are not satisfied, right? And maybe it's because they're trying to keep them unsatisfied because it, they know it'll get them to the polls. Or maybe it's because they just run the party now, so they don't have any way to push back against it. But nobody in the Republican Party is like, we can't win elections this way. We have to pretend to be normal, which historically Republicans have at some point been like, we can't win elections this way. We have to pretend to be normal. Let's nominate Mitt Romney. You know, we don't love everything he does, but he seems like a very normal guy. But instead, there's nobody driving the ship. Everybody's like, we can just be as crazy as we want. And so there we are. I mean, part of this is that's federalism. But we played this out in the IVF debacle, and I think very vividly. But I'm curious if this seems right to you guys. They're in that box. That's it. It's a box. I personally think they'll, they would shy away. But look, if it's exactly as you said. It's just if a blastocyte is a human being, and that's what with the IVF decision and wrongful death, that's the box they got them in. I think at the end of the day, though it will expose tremendous hypocrisy, they'll be looking for an exit strategy. One thing that I think is missing from the discussion of the political dynamics here, they absolutely are in a box totally. But the other thing is, is that the right-wing evangelicals, the pro-life movement spent 50 years waiting for this prize. And now they are seeing that as soon as you get an amendment on a ballot, you lose it. So, and I do think that is playing into this because in a different reality where it was holding up a little better, yes, you're still going to have crazies who are kind of like, next, we're going to do that, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. But I do think one thing that is playing in here is that they worked for 50 years to get this prize. They got it. And now it's kind of slipping through their fingers. And that is making everything more frenzied. And there's a kind of a smash and grab feeling at the moment that time is not on their side. And it's not. You know, now we're going to have one of these things in Arizona. We're going to have one in Montana. We're going to have one in Nevada. So that kind of graspingness, yes, some of it is that's just the nature of political extremism. But it's also this thing. Again, they worked for 50 years to get this special pony, right? And now they have it. And and the parents are going to sell the pony. And like you're, you're like, what the fuck? What about my pony? Right. So that is playing into that frenzy we're seeing playing out with like IVF and all the other things, even though, of course, that's always been part of the agenda, but it's making it a little a little more frenzied. That is really, really nicely put. All right. It is now time for a spirited debate. Brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thanks, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we start with two of our absolute favorite things, dessert and wine, and combine them into one delicious topic, dessert wines. What are they exactly and how are they made? Grab a fork and a glass and let's dig into this sweet subject matter. Dessert wines are just as you'd hope they'd be, sweet wines that are typically served after a meal. Sometimes they're served with a dessert, and sometimes they're served as dessert. And then there are those times in between. The smoothness and lack of acidity make for a pleasant and easygoing taste that pairs perfectly with relaxation. I reach for dessert wines when I'm craving something sweet to enjoy while unwinding in the evening or after a big meal. To make a sweet dessert wine, the fermentation process is halted just prior to the yeast converting all the sugar to alcohol. Interrupting the fermentation ensures that there is sugar remaining in the wine, which gives us that sweetness we crave. But the amount of sweetness varies from wine to wine, and there's no shortage of options. Just pop into Total Wine & More, and you'll see many, many varieties, from ports to ice wines to Sautern and to Hungarian Tokai. Dessert wines come in both still and sparkling, too. They're also made from both red and white grapes. And they can be served chilled in a small glass or room temperature, proving that really, when it comes to dessert wines, anything goes. Hungry? Thirsty? Maybe a little of both? Stop into your local Total Wine to check out our large selection of dessert wines, and feel free to chat with a helpful guide for a recommendation. Cheers! Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. 
All right. I wanted to spend our last minutes discussing the state of play of immigration, both because it is, you know, next to Trump himself, the paradigm point of divide in the country. And it also is coming in the events of this week to illustrate perfectly the sort of campaigning different styles between the parties. So, you know, nothing sets it up better than Trump's comments this week in Michigan and Wisconsin that immigrants are animals. And then in a perfect Trumpian fashion, doubling down, Democrats said, please don't call them animals. I said, no, they're not human. They're animals. All right. So just trying to set this up in sober, clear eyed terms. Let me start here. This may be obvious, but why is Trump making such a big deal about immigration on the southern border in Michigan and Wisconsin? I think it's the alternative explanation for why things got tough when corporations stopped paying taxes. They went from you know, like 25 percent of our federal revenue to six percent when billionaires stopped paying taxes, when more and more of the wealth of the country went to the billionaires. People notice that kind of stuff and they notice they're not being listened to in Washington because of the influence of the billionaires. So they're they're angry. And here's a facially plausible explanation that distracts people from the fact that it's the people funding Trump and the people who he catered to when he was president that are behind the economic discomforts. It's just a great way of deceiving and changing the subject. And tried and true. No Irish need apply was uh, the famous, you know, 100 years ago. Right. But he also has one issue, right? He wouldn't let them pass the immigration bill because he was like, immigration is all I have. So he's not going to, I mean, he can't run on the economy. He can't run on, you know, he would like to run on all Democrats or pedophiles, but for whatever reason, he has not started normalizing that yet. This is all he has. How should the Dems then play on this issue? So it's all he has. Do they need to be worried about being too soft? Yeah, look, it's going to be a motivator for Trump's base. I think that's a given. It's a challenge for Democrats. We do have this issue of these years-long backlogs to get a basic asylum adjudication, which is a big problem. Trump gave the Democrats a fairly good way to engage this issue by just saying, we had a bill. We had a bill that had all the stuff you guys are asking for, and you said not to pass it. So if you're reconsidering, crank it up again, we'll pass it. Like, what's the problem? And I do think that was really kind of a gift that Trump uh, gave them because he put his fingerprints so clearly on it. There are obviously critics within the Democratic Party about things that were included in that bill. And some of those criticisms are very reasonable criticisms. But we kind of, you know, crossed that bridge. The bill was queued up to go. So I think that is the political answer in the context of 2024. You come back like, okay, yes, all the things you just said you want, we had a bill, you killed it, you're a hypocrite. And if you've decided not to be a hypocrite, let's queue it back up and we're good to go. And Trump is in some ways the, the best example of this in politics. Often politics does not go by, do you have some silver bullet answer that is going to persuade the other side to embrace your position, you have to have something to say in these political back and forths. And you need something to say that your side can say, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And the other side can say, huh, okay, well, uh, something, you know, <laughs> and this gives them that, right? It's yeah. something that, because what do you say to that? You're going to say, oh, it was uh, 20,000 immigrants and bad people and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is it's tough to respond to. And I, again, in a political context of this year, that's what to say. And, and Trump gives his enemies a lot of space to say, look, we have to change some of the ways we manage the border. But like, we're not going to do these kind of perils of Pauline about threatened white virgins being massacred by immigrant hordes. It's so monstrous and horrible, the things he says, that says, look, of course people want to come here. Why wouldn't you want to come here? It's a great place to be. We need to manage things. We love immigrants, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I'm not saying it's going to be a slam dunk for Biden and Democrats, but I think Trump has given them a pretty good script for how to handle 
this question politically over the course of 2024. Plus, he wasn't very deft about keeping his fingerprints off his interference. Exactly. He could have handled that so much better. They could have kind of worked it a little more in the Senate and kind of not gotten it there, but they didn't. He, it was very clumsy. And, and I think they realize now how clumsy that was because, again, Democrats have a great retort. Cue it back up again, man. We're good to go. Great point. All right. Um, this week, we have one final question for the senator based on a recent law review article that you published. It's a thorough examination of how the Roberts Court has engaged in fact finding. Really interesting point and analysis because that's obviously not not normally the lookout for appellate courts. And much the fact finding in cases like Dobbs or Citizen United was dubious, I think you could say. At best. At best. Dubious at best. In fact, that's actually what I've written. Dubious at best. But what explains this development in the court's behavior? And is there any putting this genie back in the bottle in the context of our politicized Supreme Court of the United States? Well, I think the first thing to do is to acknowledge the problem. And then we can think about how you repair it. Where it leaves us is that we have really important decisions that have changed the entire democratic operations of our country, like Shelby County and Citizens United, which stand on pilings of fact-finding that are fake, that aren't really there. But the Supreme Court won't acknowledge that, despite the fact that it's indubitably true. And so these zombie decisions are still alive and still walking the landscape with no plausible analytic basis to support the outcome there. And I think the more we point that out, the better off uh, we are. They have gotten away with undermining one of the most basic elements of the American judicial system, which is that fact-finding takes place in trial courts where there's less room for shenanigans and room for appeal rather than in the back room, in the chambers, after the argument and the brief is all over, and you got three or four justices making it all up off stuff they've been fed by amicus curiae briefs paid for by billionaire front groups. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. Or what they've seen on Twitter that afternoon. Right. It's, it's, I'm not even sure it's amic amicus brief sometimes. <laughs> It's funny. Once you have an eye for this, and Senator, you more than anyone have given people this vantage point, it really does jump out at you. Their sort of statement that you're reading through the, the opinion. Like, what? What the? How did you just, where did that come in? Where did that come from? As Molly might say, what the fuck are you doing? Just <laughs> inserting. All right. Thank you very much for explaining. We've got only a minute or two left for our final feature of Talking Five where we take a question from a listener and we have to answer it in five words or fewer. Very up to the second climatological question today, the big earthquake in New York. What spin will Trump put on the New York City earthquake? Five words or fewer. My spin is Trump Tower trembled. <laughs> nice. I think that's an obscure Ayn Rand book. <laughs> that it's, uh, I saw it in the Strand once, maybe. That was a good one. I'll join the gentleman in his, the gentleman from Rhode Island in his remarks. Kind of, what <laughs> okay. are they, how do they do it up there, right? Something like that. Molly Jong Fast? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that's a, that's a pretty, I think his is better than mine. Woke tectonics. Yeah, woke tectonics. That's a good one. Oh, nice. Mine's a little more straightforward, but Trumpian. God wants the trial delayed. We are out of time. Thank you so much, Molly, Senator Whitehouse, and Josh. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube, where we post full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter, at TalkingFedsPod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon. Talking Feds is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. And you can now leave voicemails with your questions for me and our guests. Whether it's for Talking Five or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments, 
All you have to do is call 727-279-5339 and leave a voice message. That's 727-279-5339. And you can still also, of course, email us your questions at questions at talkingfeds.com. And this just in, the latest franchise in our series of Talking Feds broadcasts, Talking San Diego is a series of live conversations between me and national figures before a live audience in San Diego. Jamie Raskin was our inaugural guest last week, and in a few weeks, Jen Psaki comes to town with her new book, Say More. So if you're generally in the vicinity or like the lunar eclipse want to plan your vacation around coming to see Jen Psaki in San Diego, please do and please spread the word. It's going to be May 15th. And if you want to get tickets or just find out information about Talking San Diego, you just log on to TalkingSanDiego.net. That's TalkingSanDiego.net. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry. As long as you need answers, the feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Catherine Devine. Associate producer, Meredith McCabe. Sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Our research producer is Zeke Reed. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Akshaj Turbailu and our music by the amazing Philip Glass. This week's episode is dedicated to Shepi Abramowitz. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. <laughs>